Well, as I mentioned, uh, today is the third Sunday of Advent, and it is also the Sunday of Joy. And for our passage this morning, we have uh, Mary's song, sometimes called the Magnificat, from Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. Lu Luke chapter 1, 46 to 55. And this is what Mary said. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Joy is a bit of a tricky concept in our society, in our culture. We have a tendency to think of joy being equal to or the same as happiness or pleasure, but that's not what the Bible indicates. Instead, the Bible seems to sort of indicate that joy is sort of the top rank of those things and that happiness and pleasure uh, uh, can be sort of subsections of joy. But joy is the big deal. And you don't necessarily, according to the Bible, have to be experiencing happiness to be experiencing joy. You don't necessarily have to be experiencing pleasure in order to be experiencing joy. But joy is not also something that is an end in itself. Joy is not a goal <clears throat> any more than happiness or pleasure should be a goal. I've heard this so many times. So many times throughout the world, especially in North America, it seems, where the goal of life is to be happy. And, and that's, that's just baloney. I mean, if you're happy, great, good, that's wonderful, but that is not the goal of life. In fact, chances are really good that if you aim after happiness as your goal long enough and hard enough, you will find that you can't get it. <clears throat> the more you aim for happiness, the more you miss it. Happiness and joy and pleasure are really and truly and properly <clears throat> kind of side effects, as it were. Think about this. The first time you had your first romantic kiss, right? You had your first romantic kiss, which was on your wedding day, right? Yeah, <laughs> just a couple weeks ago. How many weeks now? Almost a month. You guys are su such an, almost two months. You guys are such an old married couple. <laughs> yeah, wow, well, you should teach pre-marriage classes now. You've got two months of experience, <laughs> right? Remember your first romantic kiss. Remember the joy and pleasure and happiness, hopefully, that that, hap that happened then, right? Now, think of the kisses after that. Are they quite the same? I mean, for Gwyneth and I, they are, but I don't think that's true for anybody else. 
right? No, they're not, they're not quite the same, right? Especially if you think, oh, if you think to yourself, oh, kisses give me great joy and pleasure and happiness. And so I am going to pursue kisses, right? You will rapidly find that kisses decline in their pleasure, <laughs> right? Or think of the, the drug addict, right? The first time, the first time they, they smoke a joint or the first time they participate in, in some form of recreational drug or, or the first time they drink a few drinks, you know, there's a pleasant buzz they get, there's a high they get and so on, but they rapidly become acclimated to that drug and the pleasure goes down and they need to get more of that drug or they need to move on to harder drugs in order to get the same pleasure. It can be true for any kind of addiction. That can be true for gambling. It can be true for pornography. It can be true for, I don't know, race car driving, right? It's an addiction. And what you are doing is you are chasing a pleasure. You are chasing a happiness. There's even scientific proof that this is what's going on. That your brain releases endorphins into your body that make you feel good and that you want to have that again. But every time you go for it again, the hit is a little bit less than it was before. And so you either have to pursue something more extreme or you have to put up with less pleasure. There's physiological proof that there's something wrong with pursuing happiness and pleasure and joy even as an end goal in itself. That's just not the way we were made. And yet it's prevalent in this world that, that, that it's almost like a human right Right? That we, we ought to have the, the opportunity to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. Truth be told, none of those three things should be our ultimate goal. Neither life, nor happiness, nor liberty. Those are not the main goals. Really, the Bible teaches us that the, the main goal is to love God and to serve Him forever. That is the main goal. And then as we do that, we experience joy and happiness and so on. And the more we do that, the more we do it, the more we will experience the joy, not because the outward circumstances of our life are great, but because God Himself, through His Holy Spirit, suffuses our lives with joy and the maturity of Christ, knowing that regardless of our circumstances, we, were doing, we are doing what we are making meant to do. And this is what Mary gets here. We've talked about, we've remarked about how young Mary probably was. She was very likely only 14 or 15 years old, and yet she has wisdom beyond what many of us will accumulate for all of our lives. I mean, let's face it. Mary is not in a particular, from the world's perspective, a particularly good situation, right? I mean, according to the law, adulterers can be stoned to death. And if Joseph calls her out, then maybe, just like the woman caught in adultery much later on and brought it before Jesus, people could say to her, hey, let's stone this lady. Right? Not good circumstances. How many of you, and, and I include myself, how many of you would like to have been caught getting pregnant or getting someone pregnant when you were a young teenager and not married yet? 
Anybody thinking, yeah, that sounds like a good time? Right? No. Nobody really wants that, I don't think. Right? And Mary is very aware of her situation. And thankfully, today, we don't stone people, at least not here. Right? So how is it that Mary can say, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior? For He has been mindful of the humble state of His servant. What it is because He has revealed to her something that is good for her. And she can see beyond the circumstances into what God is promising. And this is, this is what we need to always remember is really at the heart of joy. Joy is not blinded by the circumstances. But instead, joy sees and recognizes the future promise and lives in that. And and whether that's the future promise, as Mary says, of all generations calling her blessed, or whether it is the future promise that, that Frank knew, although he struggled, but he knew it, the future promise of being finally whole and healthy and cleansed and cleared of all that plagued and, and caused him trouble. Everything from his health concerns to his worries. Right? There is a weird way in which the mature Christian can live in joy even while facing depression. And and I speak of this out of some experience, not that I would say to, you know, that I'm like the most mature Christian ever, but I've had to live through the depression and know that somewhere deep inside, even in spite of the blackness of the world that surrounds me sometimes, even in spite of that, there is a joy and knowing and longing for the reality that God has promised that it will be made right and good and awesome. holding on to that bright spark of truth in the midst of the darkness. That is joy too. Joy is so profound and so wonderful and so amazing, both because it it is so unusual in the sense that you you can't pursue it head on. You'll miss it. You, you, You need to pursue God and then the joy happens. And also because not only is joy that kind of thing that you have to pursue God for and then it happens, but also joy is something that is so counterintuitive in the sense that you can have it even in the midst of the worst circumstances circumstances externally or internally that you might face in this world. Joy is not something that is driven away by whatever is happening in your life. But even more than that, joy is is significant not only because it you don't shoot right for it and because it is true regardless of your circumstances, but it is also significant because it points to something else. It always points to something else. In this world, it is always pointing to God. That's what joy does. There is a longing within each one of our souls that should be there. That should be there. We should want to be with God. And when we don't, there is a hole in our hearts, in our lives. 
Who was it? Blaise Pascal who said there's a God-shaped hole in everybody's heart? Right? I'm paraphrasing. Sorry, Blaze. Right? We long for something more than this world. And even the atheist, even the person who has never heard the Gospel, even the person who, who never had the opportunity, there is still that longing. <clears throat> we, all you have to do is look around for a couple of seconds to realize that this world is not, it's not the best. I mean, there are great and beautiful and wonderful and awesome things in this world, but it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And there is something deep in our hearts that longs for perfection. And God is the only perfect. God is the only one who can make things right. And God is the one who promises to make thing right, things right. And so joy points to God. One of the beautiful things about C.S. Lewis's life was his recognition of what joy really means. He went through this journey of discovering that, that he, he experienced pleasure, he experienced happiness, he experienced pain, but then he would try and, and, and pursue that thing, whatever it was, and he would find that it was disappointing, that it was constantly diminishing returns for the same effort. And so eventually he came to the point, wait a second, if... if if I am pursuing pleasure and it keeps on decreasing for me, then maybe I'm missing the boat somewhere. Maybe I'm missing out on something. And eventually in his book, Surprised by Joy, it leads to the realization of just exactly what we're talking about. That C.S. Lewis realized that he needed to pursue God. And then the joy, it happens. Mary's song is so great because she sees it. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Who cares what my other circumstances are? I can see beyond the danger and the social implications and all that. I can see beyond that to see that from now on all generations will call me blessed. And I can see beyond that to see that God has done great things for the people of Israel. He has helped His servant Israel remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever. Even as He said to our fathers. Brothers and sisters, this Christmas, this Sunday of joy, let us not cultivate joy by pursuing happiness and pleasure and joy, but instead, let us cultivate joy by pursuing God. Let us pursue God just as He has pursued us with His Son, Jesus. Let us pray. Father in Heaven, thank You so very, very much for the joy You bring us, O oh God. Not that it is a goal in and of itself, but that it is a gift from You even alongside all of Your other many gifts. And most of all, O oh God, it is a gift alongside your Son, Jesus Christ. The greatest gift of all. Father, help us to pursue not our own pleasure, to pursue not our own happiness, to pursue not joy, but instead to pursue you, O oh God. Father, 
May your Holy Spirit work in us, especially in this season, to bring us joy regardless of our circumstances, regardless of pain or suffering, regardless of fear, regardless of depression or anxiety, regardless of grief, regardless of sorrow, even regardless of supposedly good things like material possessions and, and pleasures. Lord, guide us into your joy, just as you did for Mary. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.